So welcome to the Living with Disability Research Centre uh, seminar for April. It is only the 10th of April today. Um, we're going to follow on. Uh, first of all, I should do an acknowledgement to country. I should acknowledge that we're on the lands here in Bandura of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so welcome to the seminar, and we are following on from last month's and have two further papers which are critiquing um, the work of the Royal Commission uh, with a particular focus on its uh, relevance and impact for people with intellectual disabilities. And today we've got two speakers um, who are both, uh, one's an adjunct and one's a PhD student of the Living with Disability Research Centre, but they also have other persona as well. So uh, they're wearing multiple hats today. So our, we've got two speakers. The first speaker will speak for probably half an hour and then there'll be time for questions. If you want to put questions, you need to put them in the Q&A and then we'll get to them when the speaker's finished. Um, if you want to use the closed captions, you need to click on the box that says captions at the bottom of your screen. Um, you will be able to access all the slides after the seminar, and you'll also be able to access a recording of the seminars um, in, a, in a week or so. So, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Alan Hoff, who is the Director of Purpose at Work, which is a consultancy that works with disability service organisations around boards and quality and safeguarding. Um, and he is also an adjunct professor of the Living with Disability uh, Research Centre. And he's going to pop up on your screen any minute now. Here he is. Um, and he's going to talk about the Disability Royal Commission and the regulation of disability service provision. So over to you, Alan. Thanks very much, Chris. And that is indeed my topic. And I'm hoping that my screen will advance. And it does not seem to be doing so. Mm. I might stop sharing and reshare and see if that helps. Ah, I know what's happened. So before we begin, I just want to give a trigger warning. I will be discussing cases of very, very serious harm to people with disability during service provision, including one case of death. And I will be um, discussing instances of assault of people with disability. Before I get to those particular cases, I will repeat this trigger warning. Um, if you do not wish to hear that material, just turn off your volume. Uh, turn off your screen, go for a walk for five minutes and come back and we'll be on different content. What I'll be covering today is firstly, of course, setting the scene uh, about uh, the NDIS Commission's uh, regulation, NDIS Commission's regulation of disability service providers. I'll be looking at what the DRC, Disability Royal Commission, said and recommended in relation to that issue and then I'll be offering my own additional critique. So let's start off by setting the scene. So my focus today is on the NDIS uh, Commission's regulation of disability service providers, not broader regulation. Uh, so for example, I'm not touching on um, how hospitals or the education system um, support people with uh, disabilities. When the British Parliament's Human Rights Committee inquired into the Waltham Hall scandal, the chair of that committee stated in the report that a regulator that gets it wrong is worse than no regulator at all. 
Now, I don't actually agree with that. I think that's a virtually impossible standard um, to meet on each and every occasion. But it is indeed important that regulators get it right. But I would argue that it's a near impossibility to do so on each and every occasion. There's been a range of research published in this area uh, already. I won't be going through these in detail. I've basically inserted this detail for the purpose of uh, the slides and they'll be shared, as Chris said, after today. But I have three articles published uh, which are relevant to NDIS Commission uh, regulation uh, with Chris and also Drew Marsh. I, we have two papers on work health and safety regulation and disability. And the real point of this slide is to mention that we're starting to see other publications as well, um, such as that by Davy, Davy Robinson, Idle and Valentine on what they call regulating vulnerability policy pro approaches for preventing violence uh, and abuse of people with disability. And also the paper by Yates Dickinson on West on people who are uh, in, in essence self, uh, well, they are running their own supports. Um, and as the opening line of that article says, I probably risk assess this myself. Uh, from my perspective, it's good to see that there is a range of research in this area. There's six recent developments, some of them as recent as this morning, and um, I'll mention uh, these also a matter of setting context. This is where I need to repeat my trigger warning. I'm about to describe a case of the death of a person with disability in a service setting. I also need to mention to any Aboriginal people who've joined today uh, that it concerns the death of an Aboriginal woman. So I'll just pause for a few seconds to enable anybody who needs to switch off the audio to do so. So two weeks ago in the Federal Court of Australia, the NDIS Commission prosecuted the organisation Live Better over the death of Kia um, Lucas. And um, both parties in that matter have submitted to the court that of the maximum penalty which is available to the court, which is $4.6 million, that the civil, the appropriate civil penalty is $1.8 million. This is the biggest penalty ever um, given in relation to disability service provision um, in Australia. I suspect it's the biggest penalty ever to be given, uh, proposed penalty. Um, to be given in relation to human services. The actual amount of the penalty will be determined by Her Honour Judge Justice Raper uh, when she publishes her decision. But it clearly is a game changer. A second recent development is the Urabina scandal as documented in Four Corners program late last year. And uh, this concerned the abuse of children with autism and their illegal restraint and therefore their uh, legal assault um, in a so-called therapeutic program run by Urabina. This resulted in the NDIS Commission commissioning uh, the Honourable Jennifer Boland, a former judge at the Family Court and uh, the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal to uh, run a review. And a summary of her review was actually published just this morning on the NDIS Commission website. And she states in that report that going forward, it's recommended that providers programs for autistic children and young persons should be carefully evaluated for clinical eff eff efficacy and safety and the expertise of the provider scrutinized. So that's paragraph 22 of that report. And later on, uh, there's a little bit more information in paragraph 48 of the report. So we can expect further regulation of services to children and young people with autism. The minister has published um, what's known as a section 180K direction, 
And this is basically a direction from Bill Shorten to the NDIS Commission that he wants the Commission to use its full range of powers in relation to restrictive practice and the illegal use of, or rather the illegal use of restrictive practices. Um, so that uh, direction actually talks about, you know, you use your full powers, civil penalties, banning orders, deregistration. Um, and it's the first such direction which has ever been given by a minister to the Commission. The NDIS review is on the list because, in fact, um, it made substantial uh, recommendations in relation to regulation, including the compulsory registration of providers and the compulsory registration of workers. I'll come back to that. There's also some significant developments in relation to aged care. And why I mentioned these is because anything which happens in aged care is likely to flow on to the disability sector as well, because government is committed to harmonisation and regulation. And so it is provide, uh, proposed that criminal penalties will be introduced in the Aged Care Act. Those criminal penalties can be uh, applied to providers to individual directors, including those serving on a voluntary basis, and also executives of organisations. At the moment, in the NDIS Act, there is only provision for civil penalties, but um, criminal penalties, uh, including potential jail terms, um, really elevates the, the um, scale of options available to the regulator, um, or rather, on application by the regulator to the courts. And the last of the recent developments is a change in the NDIS Commission leadership. I think the um, Minister has made a most interesting appointment of the Acting Commissioner uh, of a former police officer. I would have thought the uh, Commissioner, that the Minister would have wanted an experienced regulator and preferably uh, somebody who is experienced in disability service provision, but that is not the case. It will be interesting to see who the permanent appointee is. Moving on to just a brief summary of the current NDIS regulatory system. Uh, important to note that it's one of many regulatory systems which exists in relation to disability service provision. You also have uh, regulatory systems under, in some of the states uh, so Victoria is an example of that, so it's New South Wales, um, but you can have regulation under consumer protection law and regulation in relation to work health and safety as well. The NDIS Commission was introduced uh, on a phase in basis um, from July 2018, so it's a relatively young regulator. It, regulates providers only. So it doesn't regulate the NDIA, it doesn't regulate hospitals, it doesn't regulate schools. But um, the NDIS review has suggested broader regulation uh, to at least uh, hospitals and schools. The NDIS regulatory system is quite complex in many different respects. The actual structure of regulation is complex in that you have provisions under the Act, you have regular um, rules, you have the NDIS practice standards, but it's also complex because some elements apply to all providers, such as the NDIS Code of Conduct. So that applies to the 170,000 plus providers, whereas things like the practice standards and requirements to report um, incidents only apply to the 16,000 registered providers. So just 10% of total providers are subject to these more serious uh, reporting requirements. The NDIS system is explicitly based on the compliance pyramid developed by Ayers and Braithwaite. And the idea is that at the base of the pyramid are all providers and all workers, and that Everybody needs support and education, but you move up the pyramid to a, a lesser number of uh, workers and a lesser number of providers, and you go through things well, like 
Well, some may be uh, subject to directions, some may um, uh, be subject to uh, infringement notices, that is a lesser form of civil penalties. Then you get the civil penalties. And finally, you can be banned from operating in the industry. Just to give you an idea of the scale of the Commission's operations, uh, last annual report revealed it had a budget of $90 million and over 528 staff. As the Boland report highlights, there's problems within the Commission in terms of flow of information across divisions or the then divisions of the Commission. Another challenge for the Commission is that it's regulating um, a huge number of providers, but it has a huge number of participants. You know, all the participants, 650,000 of the NDIS. Um, and it's so it's not a system, a regulatory scheme, which is likely to result in intimate relationships between um, the Commission, the regulated, or the Commission and uh, particular clients, although one can imagine it's possible in some cases. So let's go on to the information sources used by the Disability Royal Commission in assessing the NDIS Commission's work. It had information from the private hearings. Um, it was very clear on reading volume one of the Commission's report uh, that uh, many people ha who had lodged complaints with uh, the NDIS Commission were not happy with the experience. It had public hearings, that is the DRC had public hearings with evidence from the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commissioner um, who was serving at a particular time, plus other senior staff of the Commission. The Royal Commission received submissions. It took note of the reports of other Royal Commissions, Child Sex Abuse Royal Commission, Aged Care, Northern Territory Child uh, T Children Detention, um, and the Victorian Mental Health Royal Commission all received a mention in the DRC's report. It also commissioned research on complaint mechanisms. Um, that's the most interesting report from my perspective. Uh, on reading, it felt like a bit of a lecture in relation to human rights law, uh, but it did have some um, interesting suggestions in relation to how uh, complaints could be handled um, in a variety of contexts. Unlike, say, the Aged Care Royal Commission, the Disability Royal Commission did not seek expert advice on regulation. So the Aged Care Royal Commission had as expert witnesses, Professor John Braithwaite and Professor Valerie Braithwaite, but the DERC didn't receive that evidence, um, nor did it seek uh, information, or at least um, publicly appears it did not seek information on some quite interesting developments uh, that are happening in regulation in, say, Britain. And I think this, um, was a missed opportunity as well. So let me go on to what the DRC actually said and recommended. And essentially the commentary was pretty much favorable and it was sympathetic. So um, in the article I published um, on this topic, um, I've set out a quote from the Royal Commission. And basically the commission the Royal Commission uh, commented quite sympathetically uh, about the NDIS Commission, noting that its workload is increasing, that it has staffing and resourcing constraints, and that its systems and processes are not capable of dealing with the volume of complaints it receives. Similar points were made by uh, Jennifer uh, Boland in her report um, in relation to the Commission's regulation of the uh, er, of the Arabina. There were 23 explicit recommendations in relation to the commission published in volume 10. In volume 11, there were six which explicitly touched on the NDIS commission. Uh, from my point of view, many of the recommendations could be described as motherhood and apple pie, to use an American expression. You know, nobody disagrees with motherhood, everybody likes apple pie. Uh, supposedly, um, and um, 
in essence, that, that the objections, uh, sorry, the recommendations were, no, you couldn't object to them, um, but whether they actually had um, much added to our understanding and added to um, the existing regime is not always clear. It, compared to the NDIS review, uh, the NDIS, the Royal Commission rather, um, made recommendation around the edges of current reform. Um, it didn't recommend root and branch reform as did the NDIS review. I'll start off um, with my analysis by looking at particular issues for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, then I'll go on to some issues for all people with disabilities. Uh, but the first one is on the list is complaints. And the commission reported um, on the complaints made under the Disability Discrimination Act, noting that just 3% of complaints come from people with intellectual disability. And if you're reliant on complaint mechanisms, therefore, to protect the people, interest of people with intellectual disabilities, um, that's going to be really challenging because you're just not getting so many complaints. A similar statistic was reported in the Commission's own motion uh, inquiry into support of the accommodation. So um, that's one of the things to be considered going forward. The Commission did recommend an increase in face-to-face -face engagement. Um, sorry, I have to keep on swapping between clarifying which Commission. So the Royal Commission recommended that the NDIS Commission increase its face-to-face -face engagement. That is likely to be more important to people with intellectual disabilities than other people with disabilities. Um, I think the recommendation for connecting people who live in supported accommodation to advocacy services is a really good one, um, as is the long overdue implementation of a national uh, community visitor scheme. So two other um, recommendations relevant to people with intellectual disabilities is a recommendation that investigators working with um, people with intellectual disabilities should actually have experience knowing how to interview people with intellectual disabilities, including those who have complex communication. Um, sorry, that was the final point. Now, of course, none of these strategies by themselves are complete solutions. They all add something to um, improve regulation of disability service provision but we must recognise that they are not of themselves complete solutions. So recommendations that were made in relation to all people with disabilities were firstly for provider registration. Uh, sorry, uh, what they didn't say for provider registration was they did not call for compulsory registration of providers, but the NDIS review did. The Royal Commission did call for compulsory worker registration and compulsory screening of workers. But one question I have is how do you identify the workers to be registered if you're not actually identifying the providers to be registered? The Disability Royal Commission joined with uh, calls from the Minister and the NDIS review for more enforcement action against providers. And I think disability service providers can expect to be under increasing scrutiny um, in, and where there is serious harm, acts of harm, to be subject to intense scrutiny in the same way that Live Better was in that prosecution in the federal court. The Disability Royal Commission noted that the NDIS Commission had repeatedly, that issues about its resourcing had been repeatedly raised. It didn't actually make any recommendations about that itself, other than that there be a review undertaken. And presumably that will be similar to the review which has recently been undertaken in of the aged care regulator. It did comment on the issue of resourcing and restricted practice. 
um, with a million and a half uh, notifications of restrictive practice use going on each year, that of itself uh, uh, consumes an enormous amount of uh, the Commission's resources. And so the Commission recommended that um, uh, class and kind, a class and kind exemption be introduced. Um, it basically says that particular classes of providers or particular kinds of incidents might be exempt from reporting, though the Commission didn't actually spell out what those classes and kinds might be. The other issue which is of interest to me was quality auditing. And one of the Commission's acting commissioners gave evidence in the witness box that the Commission's quality auditing was essentially a process audit. So for example, um, uh, it was auditing that an incident management system existed with the provider, not whether that system was effective. I was surprised by that evidence because that was contrary to my understanding of the Commission's uh, uh, quality audit guidelines and the DRC also expressed its surprise. We know the work from the work of Braithwaite, uh, Mackay and Braithwaite in aged care, that it's actually really important for um, audits to focus on the uh, purpose or intention of a rule rather than with the detail of the rule. If you really want to get good quality audits, making a difference to practice, that focus on purpose is indeed important. Um, presumably the NDIS Commission has reflected on what the uh, Disability Royal Commission said and hopefully has changed its thinking in relation to that issue. So in this last um, section, I'm going to offer my additional critique. And they're in a number of categories. The first one is that trade-offs and unintended consequences were not, were not acknowledged by the Disability Royal Commission. In uh, one of my articles, I have argued strongly that in any regulatory scheme, there are inherently trade-offs and unintended consequences. Um, and what can easily happen is that, um, you know, when there's a failure of regulation, uh, there's a knee-jerk reaction to move to a different process. But sometimes when that occurs, people don't understand that there will be unintended consequences um, of that action. To quote one quality manager I greatly respect, Simon McDowell, compliance does not equal quality. Well, at least it does not necessarily um, equal quality. And we know that from the research of Beadle Brown and colleagues. We also know that action to drive compliance does not necessarily lead to action to drive quality. And there's a shocking study by Hillman in Aged Care where um, attempting to improve compliance in relation to the prevention of falls resulted in dehumanising uh, treatment of um, the elderly people in care. So uh, um, people on the, workers on the ground were, would prefer that the older person toilet in a nappy rather than uh, assist them to get out of bed because if they got out of bed, um, they might fall. So we shouldn't assume that action to drive compliance equals action to drive quality. Indeed, there is limited research on drivers of improved quality in our section, in our sector. And one of the questions that needs to be asked is can we learn from implementation science? Although a great deal of um, the early work on implementation science was actually done in the disability sector, it was concerned with new initiatives and we need a, a new body of research on, in essence, day-to-day -day, uh, service delivery. 
A second group of issues can, goes to what I call policy equity. Well, why is it that if you are a provider of closed employment, an Australian disability enterprise, that you can be subject to a fine like the you know, ones we've seen from the um, sought by the NDIS Commission in the federal court. But if, you, uh, if the exact same circumstance was to occur in open employment, um, namely a disability employment service, there is no fine whatsoever. Um, jumping to the last point, um, why is it if particular acts are done by NDIS providers, they can be subject to those enforcement actions but if they're done in the hospital no no issue no no penalty uh, is imposed there's no comparable regime in relation to uh, hospitals if we take a really punitive approach to errors in disability service provision then we get things like well allied health professions working working in NDIS can be subject to these strong powers, but not those working in health. And so as an allied health professional who are in short supply, you may in fact choose to work in health because you're not subject to the same uh, regime. In which case, how are the needs of people with disability going to be met um, under the NDIS? Another key issue is why are the 10% of providers who are registered subject to uh, greater um, enforcement action than the unregistered providers. Yes, the unregistered providers can be subject to, uh, to civil penalties, for example, uh, for breach of the NDIS code of conduct, but they are not subject to the additional penalties which would exist for breach of registration requirements. There are some important issues to consider about the uh, resourcing trade-offs. You know, what is the optimal investment of resources in the work of the NDIS Commission? Um, and um, in view of time, I won't go into those in detail. There are certainly um, issues around the resources consumed by restricted practicing, uh, uh, restricted practice reporting, and as the Commission said. Uh, there needs to be some control on volume in order to focus on risk. Um, uh, I'm inventing ter a term, the restrictive practices outrage machine, because every time the Commission publishes its report, it of course has a high uh, level of reporting in relation to unauthorised use of restrictive practices. There is always an academic or an advocate who condemns that, as a breach of human rights, et cetera, which it is. But how do we resolve this issue in the context of a shortage of behaviour support practitioners? Um, I'd also touch on the issue of enforcement. Malcolm Sparrow in his work, uh, um, the book, The Regulatory Craft, urges us us not to get up on what tools to use, you know, a tool such as notification or a tool such as enforcement, but rather to find important problems and fix them and to do that by the best means possible. Um, I previously touched on the issue of quality auditing. Um, I do think by and large the NDIS uh, sorry, the DRC's uh, work on uh, regulation by the NDIS Commission was adequate, but I think the NDIS review took a much, which had a much tighter focus, um, took a much uh, more sophisticated approach to understanding regulatory issues and I think the recommendations that the NDIS review uh, made uh, go uh, closer to a, a root and branch review uh, rather than just fluffing around the edges. Chris, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you, Alan. There's a, there's a huge amount there to unpack.
for the person, for any of us who don't have the sort of in-depth knowledge, I think, about regulation that, that you do. Um, and I've been sort of writing a whole series of questions down as you've been going. All right. So welcome back. Um, this is our second speaker for this afternoon is Laura Hogan, who is the Chief Operations Officer of the Centre for Disability Studies and is also a PhD candidate at the Living with Disability Research Centre. And she's also an occupational therapist who has held senior positions uh, in the New South Wales state government. So has a great depth of knowledge around allied health services. So she's going to provide a critique of the Disability Royal Commission's approach to allied health services. So over to you. And remember, if you want to put questions in, please put them in the Q&A. Welcome, lawyer, Laura. Lovely. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of the research seminar today. So um, I... I uh, would like to start with an acknowledgement of country. So I am on different lands. I'm north of the border up in New South Wales. So I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which I am on, the Wongal people of the Eora Nation. And I honour the ancestors of yesterday, the custodians of today and those of tomorrow. And I recognise the continuing connection to land, water and how land, how culture is held, nurtured and shared. So this is what I am going to cover off today. Um, I want to give you just a wee bit of background into the allied health workforce in Australia. Then a little bit about that, what we know about health for people with intellectual disabilities. I then want to talk to you about what the uh, Disability Royal Commission's approach was to healthcare, the evidence that they heard, the recommendations that they made, what are the challenges with implementing those recommendations, and then some concluding comments. So by means of background, what does this term allied health mean? So the peak body allied health professionals Australia defines it as that health professionals that are not part of the medical, dental or nursing professions that are university qualified practitioners with specialist expertise in preventing and diagnosing and treating a range of conditions and illnesses. Now, who falls under that umbrella group will change depending on where you are in Australia. If you're looking at the Department of Health, they'll give you a slightly different perspective than if you're looking at Allied Health Professionals Australia. But some of the common professions that fall under the Allied Health Group that don't tend to change are occupational therapy, physiotherapy, dietetics, speech pathology, exercise physiology, and social work. And as Chris said, my background is as an occupational therapist and I've worked in the disability sector my whole career and predominantly in the intellectual disability space. So when we think about the allied health workforce in Australia, before the NDIS, I spent 13 years working in direct clinical, clinical governance and management roles in the New South Wales government. At that time, disability certainly wasn't sexy. We struggled to recruit to positions, especially on the teams where our clinicians worked with adults with intellectual disabilities. It was a bit odd. The paying conditions were good. Allied health professionals worked in multidisciplinary teams. They received clinical supervision, professional development. There was career progression, but it just wasn't seen as a career or choice for many allied health professionals. We also didn't have a particularly big workforce. I worked for a region that covered half of Greater Sydney. We have spanned from the Blue Mountains to Palm Beach and the north side of Sydney Harbour. We had four OT positions that supported all adults with intellectual disabilities who lived in government group homes, large residentials, and countless people who were living in the community. Occasionally, a private um, therapist would come in and see one of our participants, but it was rare. We had big caseloads and reasonably big waiting lists, but it also never felt like, our, um, like the demand really outstripped our capacity. The NDIS has really shifted the way that the disability sector um, in Australia. There's been a substantial increase in the number of people with disabilities who access funding, and this has resulted in a significant increase in the workforce. We now know that 55% of all NDIS providers are delivering allied health supports, um, but despite this, demand still outstrips capacity. It's anticipated uh, that by 2025, a further growth of 40% is required to address needs, so that's by next year. Um, in terms of the NDIF, was, was, in terms of the NDIS, we've also seen a shift in the way that allied health professionals work. 
Uh, whereas in the past, we had people mainly employed in government and non-government organisations. Now 50% of all L um, NDIS allied health professionals are working as sole traders. And then just a little bit of information about health for people with intellectual disabilities, which I'm sure doesn't come as a surprise to any of you. So we know that people with intellectual disabilities are at much higher risk of chronic health conditions, that these are not diagnosed or they're poorly managed and they result in poorer health outcomes and premature death. We know that people have higher health, have greater health inequalities than other subgroups of people with disabilities. They have more contact with health professionals than people without intellectual disabilities. Um, and they have health needs that are missed or not addressed by mainstream health systems. Despite this knowledge, there's been very little improvement in health outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities. So the Disability Royal Commission came along and they sought to understand if people with cognitive disabilities were subjected to neglect in the health system. And although their focus was on people with cognitive disabilities in relation to healthcare, they noted that they were particularly interested in the barriers for people with intellectual disabilities. Now the health workforce that they considered was broad. It included doctors, nurses, dentists, pharmacists, psychologists, and allied health. So as an allied health professional who's worked in the intellectual disability sector nearly my whole career, watching the sector grow and change, I was particularly interested in how the Disability Royal Commission approached this workforce. So the focus of my critique today is on allied health professionals, but specific to healthcare for people with cognitive or intellectual disabilities where it's possible to separate that group out. And another reason why I'm interested in this group is that of all of the healthcare professionals in Australia, allied health represents more than a quarter of this workforce. So in, 2000, oh sorry, in 2019, the Disability Commission published an issues paper on healthcare for people with cognitive disabilities. This paper posed 10 questions about the quality and experiences, barriers and possible solutions. People with cognitive disabilities and their supporters and the broader sector were invited to respond. 38 responses were received, and of these, three were from allied health professional bodies, with several others referencing the allied health professions or allied health services. And these responses um, identified a range of unmet allied health needs, um, which resulted in harm. And these included, and I've tried to sort of match up um, which allied health profession might respond to it. So some of the unmet health needs were barriers to communication, which sits with sort of the remit of speech pathology, people experiencing recurrent falls, which um, sits for physiotherapy and possibly exercise physiology. There was unexplained weight loss, which is the realm of dietitians, and also the deterioration of health and death due to swallowing difficulties, which also sits with speech pathology. So following on from the issues paper, um, the hearings then commenced and the first was public hearing four. This was held over 10 days in early February, uh, 2020. And despite the identification of the unmet allied health needs in the issues paper and the resulting harm that, these, that this caused, the hearings had no witnesses um, representing the allied health professions. And of the professional and academic witnesses who did participate, they were predominantly from medicine and nursing with very few references made to allied health services. Um, then public hearing six happened in September, 2020. And although this hearing was not specific to healthcare, it received a submission from the peak body for rural and remote allied health professionals, um, SARA. So in their submission, SARA noted that the shortage of allied health professionals working in rural and remote Australia is more severe than for general practice, hospital teams or for nursing. And that this shortage is meaning that people with disabilities are developing new or experiencing worsening conditions because they're unable to access appropriate allied health services. Sarah also noted that although the NDIS has led to an increase in the allied health workforce and improved access to allied health for many people with disabilities, this is not consistent across rural and remote communities. Despite there being no involvement from allied health in public hearing four, it did identify concerns that healthcare professionals more broadly lacked the knowledge and skills to appropriately um, provide healthcare supports to people with cognitive disabilities. 
um, and that this was resulting in harm. And this evidence led to a specific hearing on this. So public hearing 10 was held in late 2020 and early 2021. And Allied Health fortunately was represented in this hearing. However, despite the diversity of the allied health professions, only one discipline, speech pathology, was selected by the commission with the possibly naive view that it would represent all allied health professions. The commission noted that it was not possible to include the full breadth of the allied health professions and took the stance that the findings related to one profession were likely applicable across the allied health professions. Fortunately, as it played out, other witnesses, including Allied Health Professionals Australia, also provided comment on a range of allied health professions during the hearing. In public hearing 10, the Commission considered that a fit for purpose workforce started with the education of allied health students. In considering this, it explored the importance of accreditation standards to govern the curriculum taught to allied health students and that they should be afforded clinical placements that are specific to people with cognitive disabilities. Moving on from students for practicing allied health professionals, the Commission considered the need for professional development content specific to working with people with cognitive disabilities. Um, in terms of what was heard from the allied health witnesses who contributed to hearing 10, Speech Pathology Australia and Allied Health Professionals Australia had different perspectives on the inclusion of population specific curriculum and practice standards. Allied Health Professional Australia supported the notion that allied health professions should have population specific standards for curricula and professional development whereas Speech Pathology Australia presented that after substantial consultation and review, it had intentionally moved away from subgroup specific standards due to under or over representation of population groups, and instead focused on the entry level competencies to work as a speech pathologist, which inherently included cognitive disability in a range of these competencies. So after the completion of, um, sorry, at the completion of the Royal Commission, a final report made 222 recommendations that span 12 volumes and an executive summary. The recommendations relevant to allied health are contained within, six vo within volume six of the final report titled Enabling Autonomy and Access. Of the 222 recommendations, eight recommendations were made to address the unmet allied healthcare needs and ensure a fit for purpose workforce. And these recommendations can be broadly get, um, grouped as being about broadening the intellectual disability health capability framework to encompass all cognitive disabilities, that, um, um, that we need cognitive specific curriculum and clinical placements for allied health students that we also need cognitive disability specific professional development standards and content for practicing allied health professionals, that state and governments need to establish and fund cognitive um, disability, multidisciplinary health and mental health services, and that health navigator positions are put in place to address the communication challenges that exist between health professionals and across services. So whilst these recommendations may sound good at first glance, there are certainly some gaps and some limitations which result in challenges with implementation. So the Commission included allied health as part of the work as part of the health workforce at the outset, and they heard evidence about issues relevant to allied health professions. But then most of the professional and academic witnesses across the healthcare hearings were from medicine and primary health. In the research evidence that the Commission heard, this was also heavily focused on content from the medical and nursing professionals. That being said, there isn't a great deal of research about allied health practice for people with intellectual disabilities in Australia, but the evidence that does exist was predominantly ignored. I suppose it's worth to say that most allied health professions don't have the same focus on further study and academia that exists in other healthcare professionals, such as psychology and medicine. I've been asked whether I personally provided submission to the Commission um, about healthcare for people with intellectual disabilities, which the answer is no. I had possibly naively hoped that there would be stronger representation from the Allied Health Professional Associations and academics, and that this collective voice would add more strength. But it's also part of the reason why I wanna complete my PhD, as I wanna be part of the change that sees Allied Health Professionals having an evidence, having a greater evidence base to support our case. 
But anyway, I'll hop off that soapbox and head back to the Commission. Um, so in the final report, the Commission has made a suite of recommendations that in most instances are applied to the whole healthcare workforce, which includes allied health. This approach in practice is not always practical um, or appropriate for allied health, and that's what I want to share with you. So the first grouping of recommendations relates to broadening the targeted strategies for people with intellectual disabilities to apply to people with to all people with cognitive disabilities. When the Commission talks about cognitive disability, it is referring to people with autism spectrum disorders, learning disabilities, acquired brain injury, dementia, and intellectual disabilities. The approach taken, um, the approach that the Commission has taken to consider the health needs of people with intellectual disabilities as part of the broader cognitive disability group is a de-differentiated approach. We have almost three decades of evidence that suggests that this approach, a de-differentiated approach to health supports are not working to address the unmet health needs and health inequalities faced by people with intellectual disabilities. The Australian National Roadmap for Improving the Health of People with Intellectual Disabilities and the Intellectual Disability Health Capability Framework is an attempt by the Australian Government to trial differentiated strategies specific for people with intellectual disabilities to alter these trends of unmet health needs. The capability framework is almost complete and ready for implementation. Delaying this to complete further work to broaden the content to be relevant to all people with con cognitive disabilities, to me, seems counterintuitive. Separate to the recommendations specific to people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities, the Commission then made recommendations about the tertiary education of allied health professionals. In this, the Commission's focus was on the workforce readiness of new graduate allied health professionals to work with people with cognitive disabilities through implementing specific curriculum and clinical placements. Unfortunately, these recommendations seem to rest heavily on the evidence heard by the Commission about Australian research about the lack of intellectual disability content in medical and nursing qualifications, and also the international specialisms that exist for both medicine and nursing. And these include the um, specialist psychiatric training and services in intellectual disability in the UK, the psychiatry um, and the specialist intellectual disability nurse qualification that exists in both Ireland and the United Kingdom. These recommendations frustratingly also conflict with the evidence from Speech Pathology Australia, who was selected by the Commission to represent the allied health professions in hearing 10 where through extensive review and consultation, they had moved away from population subgroup specific standards to address previous issues that had been experienced with under and over representation concerns. There also aren't advanced scopes of practice or specialist training requirements for allied health professions working with people with intellectual or cognitive disabilities in Australia. Instead, universities focus on ensuring that new graduate allied health professions, professionals are equipped with the entry level skills to work with people with a range of disabilities across and health needs across the life course. It is not feasible to equip allied health students with the skills and knowledge to work with all the population groups that they possibly might encounter in their practice. Rather, once they graduate, allied health professionals develop more specialist skills and knowledge in their area of practice through practice-based experience, professional development and clinical supervision. So if, in terms of um, that, the Commission then also made recommendations that allied health students required cognitive disability specific clinical placements. Um, but in making these recommendations, the Commission didn't address some of the practicalities of implementing it. Firstly, they tasked the responsibility of implementing these placements with the Australian Government Department of Health and Aged Care. It's an interesting choice as many of the disability sector clinical placements um, that exist for allied health professionals are under the National Disability Insurance Scheme or are with clinicians who are working under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The recommendation also fails to address the evidence that since the implementation of the NDIS, there's been far less student placements available in the disability sector. And this is attributed to the fact that it takes time to supervise students and that time is not directly billable under the NDIS. And this makes it difficult for allied health professionals to meet targets when they have students on placements. <clears throat> 
These recommendations would have been far more practical and feasible if they had addressed the fact that multiple agencies need to be involved in the implementation. The next area that the Commission addressed was workforce capacity for practising allied health professionals, where recommendations were made to increase the capacity of the workforce um, to work with people with cognitive disabilities and reduce the harm they experienced. While there is merit in many of the recommendations, there was also little consideration given to the practicalities of implementing the recommendations, especially the interface with the NDIS. The recommendation to increase the availability of professional development content relevant to cognitive disability is excellent and something that I fully support. Prior to the NDIS, it was rare for the Allied Health Professional Associations to run content specific to intellectual or cognitive disability. And if it was, it was usually focused on paediatric services. This is actually one of the reasons why I'm not a member of my professional association, as I simply did not see the value for money relevant to my area of practice. And I was already registered with the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency or APRA. Since the NDIS, there has been far more professional content, um, professional development content that is relevant to people with cognitive disabilities, but there could certainly be more. The recommendation that this content is shared across allied health professions is also a good one and could help to build multidisciplinary collaboration. However, the recommendation to embed this, these professional development uh, into accreditation standards becomes tricky to implement for the allied health professions. And there are two reasons why that is the case. The first is that not all allied health professionals are subject to professional development standards. For professions who require registration with APRA, such as occupational therapy and physiotherapy, there are professional development standards. But for other allied health professions, including speech pathology and social work, clinicians are encouraged to be members of their professional associations. And while some funding bodies require this, it's not mandatory in all contexts. Secondly, the area of practice that an allied health professional works in will rightly be influenced by the focus of their professional um, development. It would not be relevant for all allied health professionals to complete mandatory professional development about cognitive disability. Within workforce capacity, the Commission also made recommendations that related to the healthcare professionals working in multidisciplinary teams. Whilst this recommendation, within this recommendation, there is failure to address the known challenges experienced by allied health professionals in undertaking. Oh, Sorry, I've just realised that my, um, my notes kind of go all over the place. Um, that's not particularly helpful. Sorry, so the Commission did recommend the establishment of multidisciplinary health teams in states and territories, which has a lot of merit, but it falls short on some of the practicalities. Multidisciplinary teams are important for responding to the multiple and often complex health needs of people with intellectual disabilities. But the Commission falls short on addressing how this works under NDIS funding. This model of multidisciplinary practice was common before the NDIS, but we have now seen a shift away from this where most allied health professionals or almost half of all allied health professionals are working as sole providers. The Commission also fails to define what it means by multidisciplinary teams. In some states and territories in Australia, we already have multidisciplinary intellectual disability health teams in practice, um, and New South Wales is one of those examples, with medical specialties, nursing and some allied health. However, having more than one allied health professional on those teams is not consistent as part of the service model, and the Commission didn't say what they meant by multidisciplinary. The next area that is relevant to allied health where several recommendations were made was about funding and service availability. The issues paper into healthcare identified that people with mild intellectual disabilities who aren't eligible, who aren't often eligible for NDIS service funding, rely heavily on Medicare to fund allied health services. Medicare only funds five allied healthcare um, sessions per year. And although the Commission heard evidence that five sessions were insufficient to address the complex needs of people with mild intellectual disabilities, especially when multiple allied health uh, professions were involved, there were no recommendations made to address this, which places people with mild intellectual disabilities at ongoing risk of harm without any strategies to remedy it. 
Other areas related to funding and service availability included the provider of last resort. A recommendation um, that was specifically targeted for rural and remote communities. These providers existed pre-NDIS and were predominantly provided by state government disability services. They worked to ensure that people did not fall through the cracks. Whilst this is a positive step forward, the Commission did not address um, availability and access to allied health services beyond the provider of last resort, and instead this was left to the NDIS review to consider. The final recommendation in this group is that all providers become registered. I personally have mixed feelings about this recommendation. There is definite merit in it being an important safeguard, um, but this needs to be carefully managed to ensure that it doesn't place a further cost and administrative burden um, on allied health providers and instead focuses on the recommendations to simplify the process and recognise where allied health professionals already hold professional accreditation or recommendation. And so in terms of my concluding thoughts, early on in the Commission, they sought to understand the issues for the whole healthcare workforce. In, in, in unpacking this, there was over-representation from medicine and nursing in witnesses and oversimplification, oversimplification of the allied health workforce. This in turn has created a range of challenges with implementing the recommendations. Many of the recommendations do not consider the diversity of allied health professions or the difference between allied health professions and the other disciplines within the healthcare workforce. This is not surprising given that only one allied health profession was selected to represent the diversity of the allied health professions. As noted, some of the recommendations also conflict with the evidence that was presented by the allied health professionals who did participate in the hearings, whilst others are impractical to implement. The Commission also fell short on many of its recommendations where there should have been comment about the interface with the NDIS. Instead, this was left to the remit of the NDIS, which has made some of the recommendations fragmented and requires work to cross-check the Royal Commission with the NDIS review. It would have been far more practical that the recommendations addressed the known challenges with the NDIS. The recommendations to take existing differentiated strategies and make these de-differentiated also seems like a step backwards and undermines the attempt to try something different to alter the unacceptable trend of unmet health needs for people with intellectual disabilities. In my opinion, the Disability Royal Commission presented a unique opportunity to unpack the issues experienced and consider what might most influence change. However, the oversimplification of the workforce combined with the recommendation to move backwards from differentiated to de-differentiated approaches raises some considerable concerns that the findings will not result in the much needed change to improve the health outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities and safeguard them from future harm. And so that's the end of me and I just have my references and I will stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. <laughs> I think it digs oh. up a lot of issues that many of us from different allied health professions are, are sort of had a sense of, but you've managed to unpack them really, really clearly, I think. A lot of food for thought. Thank you so much, both of you today. Um, for anybody who wasn't here at the beginning, the slides will be available on our website and the recording uh, recordings will be available too very soon. We'll put a notice on LinkedIn um, when they're available. So thank you again, Alan and, and Laura. Both those papers will be published in, in RAPID, which is Research and Practice in Intellectual and, Dis Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, they're likely to be open access, so you'll be able to get hold of them. Um, next month is May, and we're not going to have a seminar because I'm going on long service leave for a month. Um, <laughs> and unless we can organise one very quickly, we won't have one. Uh, we might see what we can do, but otherwise we'll see you again in June. Thank you very much for coming today and sharing and asking such good questions. <laughs>